We have four very fine presentations today. I'm Dr. Wendy Wright, and I have the privilege of being the moderator of this year's uh, senior seminar. Um, the format will be that our presenters will read their prepared papers that they have worked on all semester for uh, 20 minutes, and then we'll have about seven to 10 minutes uh, to uh, ask questions, have conversations, and then we'll clear the room of anyone who has to leave or anyone who is going to come for another presentation, and we'll try to keep right on schedule. So I'm going to begin, and a little bit of explanation here. Um, David Martin's parents would have loved to have been here, and they requested that he webcam his presentation. So we have a little um, technological uh, event here. So I'm going to begin with uh, David. His topic is Our Lady of Guadalupe, Spanning Two Worlds. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. When one thinks of Mexican spirituality, it is likely that the first thing that comes to mind is Our Lady of Guadalupe. This appearance is essential to the Mexican Catholic identity, even today. Guadalupe emerged out of the struggle of the Spanish conquest and provided an avenue towards personhood that originated from the indigenous self. The persecuted natives of New Spain were able to find a source of identity that resonated with their own people and culture instead of being placed into a social order of Spanish origin. The image accredited to the appearance contains elements that resonated with both the Spanish colonizers and the conquered indigenous, providing common ground on which to meet. Our Lady of Guadalupe bridged the divide between two radically dissimilar cultures and provided a Christian identity for the indigenous of New Spain. The year 1492 was pivotal for the development of the Western world and the yet unfathomed changes that would be occurring west of the Atlantic. It was in this year that Cristoforo Colombo had discovered a new world and the year that the last crusade of the Iberian Peninsula had ended with the Battle of Granada. This region had been a troublesome concern for the monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, who were trying to unite the Iberian Peninsula into one domain of Spanish-speaking Catholicism. The Reconquista had been enormously successful in expelling the Moors from across Spain, but had so far failed to evict the non-conforming Muslims from Granada. The definitive victory over the last bastion that resisted the Spanish Catholic rule was tremendously unifying for Spain and endowed those in power with the belief that God was unequivocally behind the Spanish imperialism. Religious, religious fervor in Spain is historically rooted in its monarchy and expressed through the cult of miraculous images. The Spanish monarchy itself was seen as being providentially established. As patriotic Spaniards accredited the monarch as being chosen by God to lead the crusade against the Moors and to Christianize the Iberian Peninsula. Philip II, who ruled Spain in the second half of the 16th century, was a devout monarch who chose for his place of residence the Escorial, which functioned as a palace, monastery, church, and dynastic sepulcher. Philip II's personal rooms overlooked the high altar of the Escorial, enabling him to constantly be in the presence of the Holy Eucharist. Religious fervor was evident in the cult of miraculous images that was popular throughout Spain. Every city in the land contained shrines with images of Mary or other saints that attracted devoted pilgrims. The most popular pilgrimage site at the time was that of Our Lady of Guadalupe of Extremadura. It is interesting to note that many of the conquistadors of the New World would have visited this shrine, as a large number of them were from the area of Extremadura, Spain. The culmination of the Spanish Reconquista ignited the belief that there was a command from God to spread the self-perceived height of civilization all throughout the world. The god of Catholicism had seemingly triumphed over foreign gods again and again, and the Spaniards saw it as their duty to spread belief in this god. While salvation was certainly integral to the Spanish conquest, the accumulation of wealth and power was also foremost in their minds. This zealous missionary mentality provided a firm basis of belief that legitimized the conquest that was to come. It is unsurprising that a culture that believed an all-powerful god was on their side would develop a sense of self-worth greater than the worth that they attributed to other cultures. The first consequence of this superiority was that the Spanish believed that they had the right to complete dominion over all lands throughout the entire world. This right of dominion was perpetuated through ethnocentric belief that the Spaniards were the only fully civilized people. This in turn was affirmed by the belief that European Catholics were the sole possessors of truth, 
Anything that did not fit into their worldview had no right to exist. These beliefs combined to place Spanish civilization on a pedestal that left no room for dialogue or discourse. Anything that did not fit into their ethnocentric worldview, especially matters concerning religion and spirituality, had to be destroyed for the glory and the honor of God and Spain. The Nahuatl people. Radically different from the Spanish conquerors were the Nahuatl people. The term Nahuatl refers to the vast array of people within the Aztec Empire and the culture that they shared. The nomadic and dispersed Aztec people founded the city of Tenochtitlan in the year 1325. Within a century, they had integrated a multitude of different cultures into an empire through both strength of arms and symbiotic relationships. Although the Aztecs were avid proponents of warfare, they adapted the customs and religions of those that they conquered into their own understanding of the universe. Instead of destroying the gods of the conquered, they brought them into a pantheon of all gods, where they received the respect and adoration that was given to the native gods of the Aztecs. The god Quetzalcoatl was very important for the Nahuatl people, especially in the year 1519. They had an extensive calendar that predicted the end of their age and the Nahuatl people as a whole with the coming of the god Quetzalcoatl. This end was prophesied to come in 1519, which happened to be the year that Cortes began his conquest of the New World. Further, the prophecy stated that Quetzalcoatl would come from the east, the direction from which the conquistadors arrived. Quetzalcoatl was identified in ancient prophecy as being a large man with blonde hair and blue eyes, an apt description of Cortez himself. Due to these religious beliefs, Cortez was greeted by the Aztec emperor Moctezuma II and revered as a god. Religion for the Nahuatl constituted the core of their identity as a people. This religion provided direct links for the indigenous to their ancestors, exemplified through religious pilgrimages and feasts to honor various gods. The destruction of that religion by the Europeans would threaten their very identity. A clash of cultures. The fateful meeting of the Spanish and the Nahuatl in 1519 represented the juxtaposition of two radically different cultures that lacked the ability to communicate beyond their own cultural assumptions. Each of these peoples had formulated different systems of value different forms of logic, and unique anthropologies that attempted to explain the human person. They had created different expressions of religion, varied languages, archaeological and artistic wonders, unique philosophies, and complex traits. Each culture approached truth, beauty, and ultimate reality from a completely different perspective. In the minds of the Spanish, land was used for the accumulation of personal property and power, as well as the proselytization of religion. In stark contrast to this, the Nahuatl saw all of creation as being the domain of the gods. Humankind was only permitted to use the land as long as the land remained in harmony with the rest of natural creation. The idea of private property was completely incompatible with their worldview. The concept of salvation for the Spanish centered on the individual. Eternal salvation was obtained through purifying the self in order to meet the religious criteria of the time. There was an emphasis on the necessity of personal conviction through sacramental practices of the individual. Temporal salvation could be obtained through the accumulation of wealth and power, <coughs> obtaining a name that would outlast the ravages of time. For the Nahuatl people, salvation was obtained for the group and existed within lived reality. The individual was valued inasmuch as it contributed to the good of the whole. While the Spaniards believed that one person had died for many to have salvation, the Aztecs believed in the exact opposite. Many had to die through human sacrifice to guarantee the continued existence of life itself. The very nature of the human person was also radically different between the two cultures. For the Spanish, the rational individual was one who dominated and conquered whatever he set his mind to. In contrast to this, the Nahuatl emphasized the communal and saw the individual as being indivisibly bound to the community and to creation. The Spanish emphasized linear discourse in a world of reason, logic, and argumentation. The Nahuatl emphasized cosmic signs and rituals in a world of omens, dreams, myths, and rituals. The divide between these cultures was incompatible. The Spaniards, with their desire for conquest and domination, as well as their apostolic zeal, set about systematically destroying the religion of the Nahuatl people. And with this destruction, the Spaniards destroyed that which was, that which was most sacred to the natives, the belief system that tied themselves to their ancestors and to the world around them. Without these, the basic identity of the Nahuatl ceased to exist. 
The Essex society post-conquest was almost unrecognizable from the previous empire. The stratified social structures of the Essex was gone, replaced by the beliefs of the Spanish. For the first time, the Nahuatl people found themselves stereotyping categorized based on the color of their skin. Women bore the brunt of this de-stratification, as they now wore the mantles of racism, classism, and sexism. No longer could women be in positions of power or authority, nor did they have any sort of legal rights or privileges. They were often seized by force, frequently the victims of sexual assault, and used for gift exchange among the wealthy Spaniards. The change in the status of women was par partially caused by the shifting of religion from the family to the institutional church. Women who were once the center of the family unit subsequently fell to the bottom of society. Those who had once had the religious positions similar to those of goddesses were now subjected to the seemingly impersonal worship of a male god. The religion and gods of the Nahuatl had been overcome and cast as diabolical forces destructive to the soul. Their places of worship had been torn down or transformed into homes for a foreign god. This smothering of all things holy was the deepest source of their collective trauma. Their women had been ravaged by men who saw them as inhuman persons. A people who had stood at the pinnacle of their known world were reduced to rubble. The removal of identity was something that was perpetuated by various Spanish religious groups at that time. In their enthusiasm to convert the natives, the clergy lost their humanity, even as they pursued divinity. There was a clear difference between the actions of the brutal conquistadors and the actions of the re religious orders that entered the New World, but it was a distinction not perceived by the Nahuatl. The conquistadors killed mercilessly and without thought, but the religious attacked the very heart of the community. They acted differently, but still were eager to destroy the very identity of the natives. Catholicism was inextricably intertwined with Spanish colonialism, and both sought the destruction of their people. A state of spiritual devastation reigned among the Nahuatl, as their gods had died and been replaced by an alien deity. The indigenous people were forced into a state of helpless, helplessness, powerlessness, fear, anger, and eventually self-hatred. Guadalupe emerges. This is the stage on which our Lady of Guadalupe would appear. A stage of violence and domination by the Spanish. A stage of hopelessness and defeat for the indigenous. In this newfound order, it was the Spaniard who was representative of the human person, and the indigenous who were dehumanized. The conquistadors were the subjects. The Nahuatl were the objects. It would truly take a miracle to change the story playing out on the stage. A miracle in the form of Our Lady of Guadalupe, of Tepeyac. A basic summary of the legend is as follows. Ten years after the Spanish conquest, the converted peasant Juan Diego is on a journey to, the, to Tlaxlico. As he nears the area called Tepeyac, the dawn is beginning. From the top of the hill, he hears the singing of birds, a song that soothes the heart and cheers the soul, and hears a call in his own language that beckons him by name. He climbs the hill and sees a resplendent woman. <clears throat> All of nature is beatified at the sight of her. She tells Juan Diego that she desires a temple constructed so that she can give herself to her people and that she is his mother, and the mother of all. She instructs Juan Diego to tell the Bishop of Mexico what he had seen so that a temple could be built on the hill. He manages to gain an audience with the Spanish Bishop who doubts his word and sends him away. Juan Diego travels back to Tepeyac and questions his worthiness for this task, as he is a lowly native. She insists that he returns to the Bishop, and he does so, only to be turned away once more. This time, the Bishop asks for a sign and sends his servants to secretly follow him. On his way back, Juan Diego hears that his uncle is gravely ill and tries to avoid the hill where the woman appeared in order to return to his uncle. In the meantime, the bishop's servants lose track of him and return to the bishop. The woman finds him and soothes his fears, saying his uncle will be made well. She sends him back to the hill to gather flowers that are blooming out of season as a sign for the bishop. Upon reaching the bishopric, the servants attempt to seize the flowers against Juan Diego's will, but he stops them and once more gains audience with the bishop. As he reveals the flowers, the image of the woman appears on his mantle. Following this sign, the bishop and the servants undergo a dramatic conversion and accompany Juan Diego to the hilltop. They also stop to see his uncle, who has been miraculously cured, and to whom the woman had given the name for her shrine, Guadalupe. Interpretation. Although seemingly simple, this story affirms the dignity and personhood of the indigenous, blending together the religion of the conquistadors and the Nahuatl people. The poem itself begins in darkness. This darkness is both symbolic of the time of desolation for the Nahuatl 
as well as a reference to the Nahuatl belief that creation itself began in darkness. In the Nahuatl Cosmovision, times of great chaos and destruction were followed by creation. Therefore, the poem intricately links the people to a new creation right from its start. This is signaled from the fact that when Juan Diego approached the hill of Guadalupe, it was already beginning to dawn. The use of imagery was important for the Nahuatl people. It was only through artistic expressions understood with the heart that people could communicate with and understand the divine. The most common examples of this throughout the accepted versions of the story can be found in the imagery of flowers and song. Flowers represent beautiful images, and the singing of the birds represents harmonious sound, each of which enable a gradual communication with and understanding of the divine. Juan Diego is sidetracked on his way to religious practice in Tlatelolco and drawn towards a presentation of the divine that was more harmonious with his inner being. Juan Diego questions himself and his experience for several reasons. As an indigenous person, he had been robbed of his worth and dignity. Thus, it seemed to him that he was not worthy of truly communicating with the divine. Additionally, the beautiful song was clearly related to his culture's understanding of the divine, something that had been systematically and brutally suppressed since the conquest. At this point, it is important to note that there had not yet been flowers, which in the Nahuatl Cosmovision were necessary in conjunction with song for divine truth to be revealed. This is indicative of the collaboration that was necessary between Juan Diego and Mary. A foreign faith was no longer being thrust upon the passive natives. It was a mutual building of understanding and trust that was deeply personal for the Nahuatl people, as represented through Juan Diego. The location of Tepeyac itself is also important in understanding the significance of the story. Far from Tlatelolco, where Spain had gradually established its power base and where the Aztecs had ruled their empire, Juan Diego felt at home. This is apparent in his relative ease while in Tepeyac, as opposed to his obvious discomfort at being in the residence of the bishop. He felt more connected to his ancestors and the environment around him, a connection that was vital to the Nahuatl identity. Tepeyac was also one of the most sacred locations in Mexico, a place of pilgrimage for the natives, long preceding the arrival of the Spanish. It was the home of the goddess Tanantzin, who embodied the female form of the greater god necessary in the harmonious worldview of the natives. It was in this place where Mother Earth regenerated life, where the divine brushed against the human. There was no coincidence that this would be precisely the place where Guadalupe would appear. Juan Diego's role as communicator for Guadalupe was also a pivotal moment for the dignity of the indigenous peoples. The Spanish religious had barred entry into religious life for all indigenous people due to the debate on whether or not the Nahuatl actually had souls. The Nahuatl also were seen as holding too closely to the religion of their ancestors. They could not be fully trusted in the religion that was forced upon them. Juan Diego serving as the interlocutor for God was a momentous occasion, sure to be recognized and appreciated by all of the natives. Even more surprising is the fact that he was sent to the bishop in order to provide spiritual direction. It was unimaginable that an Indian worker with no inherent worth would be instructing the spiritual leader of the Spaniards in matters concerning faith. No longer was it the Spanish solely dictating manners of religion, but an indigenous had been raised up to engage in dialogue and to instruct. The treatment of Juan Diego by the bishop's servants is indicative of the position of the natives at the time. He was ridiculed, tormented, suspected, followed, and almost forced into revealing the miracle on his mantle. This was an example of the societal class system set up as a result of the Spanish conquest. The native workers had no worth, no humanity, and no dignity and were thus prey to those who had power. However, Mary's instruction to Juan Diego that he not reveal the miracle to any save the bishop gave him the strength to stand up against his oppressors. He was no longer a passive agent beholden to the powers around him. Rather, he was given agency and was able to act as he saw fit. When Juan Diego first saw Guadalupe, the world on top of the hill was transformed by her resplendent beauty. This was a sign of hope to the oppressed natives of the land. Their world would be transformed with the help of Our Lady. She affirmed their dignity, calling Juan Diego by name in his own language in a voice filled with compassion and love, empowering him beyond the self-doubts born from a society that had robbed him of his worth. Although she wore garments of nobility and power, Mary addressed Juan Diego as an equal and even bore resemblance to the indigenous people. She was the Mary of the foreign religion, but she appeared in such a way as to stand firmly among her Nahuatl children in ways that would affirm their dignity and their basic worth as human beings. 
The appearance of Our Lady of Guadalupe provided the healing that was necessary for the indigenous while using imagery and religious affiliation that would have been abundantly familiar to the people of Spain. Her name itself represents the sharing of culture. To the indigenous who had no G or D sounds in their language, her name was heard as Coatlicue, another name for the goddess Tonantzi, the mother goddess. To the Spanish conquistadors, raised in the religious fervor of that time, this name would have sounded like Guadalupe, the patroness of the shrine in Extremadura. In these ways, she bridged the divide between two radically dissimilar cultures that have been utterly incapable of communicating up until this point. Over the next several centuries, Our Lady of Guadalupe would become the defining cultural icon of the majority of her region through her affirmations that she was the mother of all sent to bring healing to those most in need. Thank you. Talk a little bit about the history of the text on which the poem is Luis Lanza de la Vega, and, and you know, where it came from in the 17th century, or how that's connected to the original apparition. You no, know, absolutely. Um, so, the historicity of the account is something that's uh, very <laughs> controversial um, at this point. Um, so, as of right now, scholars think that uh, Antonio Valer Valeriano was a uh, Nahuatl who was educated by the Spanish at the time. And in the, um, sometime in the mid to late 16th century, he actually provided an, an account of that in Nahuatl, um, which De La Vega would translate and popularize as the Nikan Mopohua, um, which is the account that is known today. Um, so that is the account as we know it. Uh, the, there, there have been some issues as to the historicity because uh, Bishop Zumaraga, who was the bishop in the story, um, he was a prolific writer who uh, made no mention of Our Lady of Guadalupe at the time, which is interesting. But his successor, uh, Alonso de Montefer, uh, who was a Dominican, um, his successor as bishop gave many homilies on Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and you know, Juan Diego was actually currently canonized as a saint as well, which in some ways probably denotes that there is some historical evidence to Juan Diego, but at the same time, many scholars today think that it was a fabrication that was used to, uh, to promote the secretization of the two different religions. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> there must be some other comments. Students? Faculty? I know you uh, spent some time in the DR. Can you speak to your personal experience of how did you, you know, were you able to see Our Lady of Guadalupe in the culture down there? Um, I did not experience Our Lady down there, um, at least in a, yeah, in the way that it's experienced within Mexican uh, um, America and whatnot. Um, it's mostly, she is the, the, the patron of Mexico primarily. Um, through immigration and whatnot that has spread pretty far throughout the United States, but different regions uh, throughout Central America have uh, different patrons as well. Um, so it's, it's pretty varied from place to place. Okay. How did a uh, <clears throat> sort of sociological explanation of this gel with your own faith explanation? How did you <coughs> manage? Okay, um, so yeah, like there's a lot of, you know, whether or not Our Lady actually appeared. Um, what's evident is that, uh, <laughs> what's evident is that she was, um, she was acclaimed by the people after the event. It was something that brought the people together in a way that provided the, uh, the link of religions, that uh, provided the Noatl a, a route to enter into Spanish Catholicism. Um, so in terms of faith, I don't think the actual historicity of the event is important. It's the way that the people naturally responded to that event and the way that they accepted it. Um, so I don't necessarily see them as contrasting. Um, you know, later, as Our Lady was used for various political means, uh, I, that gets into murkier territory. Um, whenever religion is used for political matters, especially uh, in terms of conquest, like the uh, the Spanish Mexicans uh, used her as a figure in their revolt against Spain. Um, 
So once we get into that area, it gets a little bit more more tricky. But in terms of the actual appearance, um, I don't think they necessarily contrast at all because, like I said, it provided the the uh, the bridge between the cultures. Okay, would you want to talk a little bit about or uh, how religious iconography like uh, Lady of Guadalupe provides uh, or can provide a kind of bridge for this huge proliferation of social and cultural identities we experience in our culture today? Um, any, any thoughts that you might have on how that can be a bridge that's still useful or maybe not useful anymore? Or? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a little bit of danger with Our Lady of Guadalupe. There was a lot of contention at the, at the start, at least, between the uh, Franciscans and the, the Dominicans, because the Franciscans saw the Noatl uh, venerating the image too much. They, they saw the images, uh, some of them saw the images being the source of like the healing of the miracles and were disappointed in the faith when that image wasn't able to live up to their own expectations of reality. Um, I think, you know, iconoclasm has been a, uh, it's been present throughout the, the Christian tradition, but um, at least today, uh, in the way that I've experienced it, um, I think it's something that really helps, can help people focus in on a specific area of religion. Um, like, for example, like the Sacred Heart of Jesus, you focus in on, you know, literally the heart of Jesus. It's not saying that that's the only part of Jesus. It's saying that through that you can get a fuller understanding or a more in-depth understanding of that specific part. And so in, in that regards, I think I, um, the use of icons can be uh, really beneficial when they're used to uh, go to something more instead of being an ends in and of themselves. Thank you. This is anecdotal, but a good friend of mine is a priest in a parish in Iowa, and he talks about there's a, a group of Hispanics, and they celebrate Guadalupe, and they, they get very, very into it in a way that seems to have lost a sense of the history of recognizing the humanity of all and, and sort of the syncretism and peace that that brings. Do you get a sense of, I mean, that's part of the politicization mm -hmm. I think of her, but is your, you get a sense in contemporary experiences that they per, somewhat perhaps regress to the Spanish <laughs> approach to church, for instance? in celebrating this and lost a sense of meaning of our way of Guadalupe as it was initially manifested? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, we're, we're roughly 15, away, 15 years away from the 500th year anniversary of when Our Lady initially appeared. Um, and so, like, as the Nawatha, like, as a separate category of, of people has kind of gotten further and further away from their like truly indigenous roots like before Spain, I think that it's kind of lost its distinctive factor in uniting the cultures because that blend did happen afterwards. And so just as a result of time, just as a result of integration into religion, I think it has lost its, it, uh, Our Lady has lost her unifying sense, at least on a surface level. Okay. Just one more question. Was there any message to the church other than to build the church? Um, from the, I'm trying to recall. Just that uh, it was a message very centered on the indigenous people that Mary would wrap them in her mantle and would uh, protect them and care for them. So I think the message was that the, the people had worth, the people had okay. intrinsic value. And so the, the story kind of represented that. Okay. Thank you so much.